welcome to The Public's Health, a product of the Alameda County Public Health Department, a show that puts the public back in the public health. I'm Dr. Anthony Eiten, the Alameda County Health Officer, and today we've got a great show. We are privileged to have a literal icon of Alameda County medicine and public health, Dr. Frank Staggers. Dr. Staggers is the chair of the Ethnic Health Institute at the Alta Bates Summit Medical Center. He's also the chair of the California Medical Association Foundation and a former chair of the California Medical Association and the National Medical Association. And we literally don't have enough time to talk about <laughs> all of his fantastic contributions to health, medicine in Alameda County and elsewhere in the state and country. Dr. Staggers, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're hoping to have you give us some information about hypertension and the significance of that disease and the kind of work that you're doing at the Ethnic Health Institute. Uh, thank you, Tony, and I, I appreciate that kind of deduction. It's the type that my mother would smile at and my father would ask who you were talking about. But <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. Well, tell us about hypertension. What, what is hypertension or high blood pressure? There, there seems to be in the public's mind a little bit of confusion about what exactly we're talking about when we say these terms. Yeah. Well, you know, if you, if you notice the introduction and that tape that they had at first. We're going to see that in a minute. Okay. Um, and when you see it, you'll see that high blood pressure really is the, the, um, the, the pressure that is exerted in the vessels that mm -hmm. take blood through the body. Mm -hmm. And it's the heart pump. So part of it is the pumping action of the heart. Mm -hmm. The other is the pressure that's in the vessels. And the big thing that the public needs to remember is that it is the major risk factor for heart disease, heart attacks, and stroke. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing they need to remember. Okay, we're going to get into, after we see a clip in a moment, on, on the public's perception of high blood pressure and hypertension. And we're going to talk about the Ethnic Health Institute and some of the things that Certainly. you're doing. But it seems to me that public awareness is really very important mm -hmm. around high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you think uh, the Ethnic Health Institute is interested in doing? Absolutely, and we've been doing it now since 1997. And after we've seen the clip, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But I think that the public will have a better understanding of some of the things that we say after they've seen the clip, if that's all right with you, Tony. Well, we're going to talk about some interesting things in high blood pressure. We're going to talk about family history. We're okay. going to talk about some of the, the effects of having high blood pressure. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about how to treat high blood pressure. Okay. And we're going to, based on what um, we see the public's perception um, is about high blood pressure, mm. we're going to address some of the misperceptions, some of the things that the public has absolutely right. Mm. And we're going to try to get to the truth on high blood pressure all in a few minutes of this show, so. We'll try to do our best to help you. Well, there's nobody that we know of that could do a better job of helping us understand that than you, Dr. Staggers. Mm -hmm. Now, um, high blood pressure is something that is pretty active in the African-American community. Is that true? No question. For example, in adult Americans in America, a uh, fourth of all adult Americans will have high blood pressure. Okay, well, let's. And half of them won't know it. Half of them won't know it. And then, and African American people who look like us, a third of them will have it. Okay, well, and half of them would know it. Let's go to the tape and we'll come back to that okay, point. Okay, thank you. High blood pressure, uh, mm -hmm. stress. Uh, smoking, stress. <laughs> Sorry, I gave you that. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, diet. An unhealthy diet, um, what did I say? Exercise, lack of exercise, and it's smoking. A lot has to do with our heredity. Might be hereditary. There's some that's just a, a genetic. There's lifestyle. There's uh, diet. Uh, first of all, no, no exercise. Uh, what you eat. And the third one would probably be your life. Meaning that if you have a lot of stress, yada, 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 you're going to get some high blood pressure. Low activity and too much eat. Too much eating. don't know that's bad. Oh well, the biggest one is death. Your life expectancy um, is usually affected. Oh god it could lead to heart attack. It hurts you sexually. That I don't know I, I haven't been without it. Uh, heart attack, stroke. 
strokes. And I have a cousin who didn't reach 50 because he had an aneurysm. Some of the signs I would uh, understand a person become disoriented, a little dizzy, uh, eyes may begin to roll in the head, get weak, begin to faint. Numbness, maybe? Shaking, uh, tongue, swallowing the tongue. I have been told I had a two mini, mini strokes. Uh -huh. That means my hand numb, mm -hmm. and my mouth was, I feeling numb. Obviously, the numbness in the in the left arm. Okay. Uh, the, there's the spot thing, you know, when you you know you're really lightheaded, and you get the spots, and then there's obviously the fainting issue. Headaches. I don't know. I, I guess. I'm 30 years old. Headache. Uh, tingling in the lower or the hands and fingers. Uh, blurred vision. Uh, speech impairment. Um, by that time, you're, 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 it's almost, you're there. <laughs> so, as we can see, Dr. Staggers is a, a fairly high level of understanding and awareness of high blood pressure in the community, at least in our unscientific sample. Mm -hmm. But there, the, in, the knowledge seems to break down a little bit when it comes to the things that high blood pressure can cause, the adverse consequences of having high blood pressure mm -hmm. either not adequately controlled or completely uncontrolled. Can you tell our viewers some of the consequences of uh, not having your blood pressure managed over time appropriately? Yeah, I think that if you looked at the, um, and saw the tape, I don't want you to get, we leave with the impression that you have to have signs in order to have high blood pressure. High blood pressure is a silent disease. And the number one killer in adult Americans, in adult Americans, as high as heart, heart disease, mm -hmm. heart disease, mm -hmm. and stroke comes second mm -hmm. after that, and so the number one risk factor though is high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you know not that it's normal. You want to know what the numbers are. Mm -hmm. Every patient ought to know what his blood pressure is because if you keep it normal, you don't have to worry about heart disease or heart attack because if your blood pressure is normal, you're unlikely to have it and you shouldn't have to worry about stroke because you're unlikely to have it. Mm -hmm. And those are, that's, that's an important thing. You have signs for stroke, you don't necessarily have to have a, a signs for heart disease and heart attack. Mm -hmm. So the, the point that you're making very clearly is that hypertension or high blood pressure is a silent killer. And in fact, people can feel well but in fact still have high blood pressure and still have the consequences of that high blood pressure on their heart, on their brains, on their kidneys, and over time that can produce exactly what you're describing, the heart attacks and the strokes which are among the, the highest killers of Alameda County residents, Californians, and Americans. Correct. So tell us, now I'm concerned. Okay. I might have high blood pressure and not know it. Yes. What should I do? Well, this so happened, this is um, Black History Month. February. Also, it's Heart Month. And for the last 10 years, we at Ethnic Health Institute, along with uh, the Health Ministry Program, the American Red Cross, the uh, black doctors in the area, and so forth, have been doing health screening in the churches and the surrounding community. We asked the churches to have the surrounding community come in. This Sunday, this coming Sunday, the 26th of February, we're going to 20 churches in the area where we will be doing that. And it's free and we'll be screening your blood pressure. You'll get a little card that tells you what your blood pressure is. You can keep it on there. So every patient ought to know what their blood pressure is, know and take it. You just can't have it one time and say, okay, I'm fine for the rest of the year. And that's an ongoing thing that you need to have checked regularly. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we're doing. So people will begin to be aware of what their pressures should be and how you follow it along. Well, that sounds like a wonderful program and a great community service. Yeah. Now, if you come in and take my blood pressure and I'm just nervous, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have high blood pressure, so I'm, I'm jumpy and edgy, mm -hmm. and then in fact you tell me my blood pressure is high, do I now have a diagnosis of high blood pressure or hypertension? No. Uh, it's just one moment in time. And what we usually do then is to have the patient rest, you know, either lie down or sit down or quietly, and you, re and you repeat the exam. 
it's a number of times. The blood pressure changes all the time. When you stand up, the blood pressure changes. You lie down, it changes. So it's, it's, it's supposed to change. You get afraid, it changes, the fight, flight theory, et cetera, and under stress. So no, our one elevation of blood pressure at any one time is not a, 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 a diagnosis of blood pressure. You have to have a stand uh, systematic periodic checks of the blood pressure where it's elevated and then you get the diagnosis. It's made usually by a physician. Okay, so now I, I've had several readings of my blood pressure in the doctor's office, in the church, at the local pharmacy, and they're all high. What happens next? I sit down with my doctor and you tell me what? We say, how's your diet first? Um, and then, you know, depending on how high it is, if it's very high, you may need medications. Certainly lifestyle changes, diet changes, exercise, loss of weight, those things will help if the blood pressure is mildly elevated. Mm -hmm. But if it's moderately elevated, you may have to go on drugs. And then certainly if it's very high, you may have to go on a combination of drugs. Mm -hmm. And those drugs will depend on, you know, where your blood pressure is. And the main thing, though, is that the patient should be compliant with the drugs. You should be compliant with your diet and especially if you have comorbidities like diabetes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, you really need to talk to your, your physician about that. But it starts though with knowing what your pressure is. Okay, so know your numbers. Know your numbers. Diet, exercise, and maybe drugs or a combination of drugs. Now, worst case scenario, okay. I don't do any of this. Okay. And I'm at risk now for a stroke or a heart attack. Mm -hmm. What are the signs of a stroke that I need to be concerned about mm -hmm. or concerned about in my elderly relative or my neighbor? Okay, all of the things that you saw on the tape, that's number one, but there are three simple tests that I usually tell my, when I was in practice telling my patients, and one was you ask the person who says they, haven't, they think they have something wrong with them, you ask them to smile. The smile should be symmetrical. It should be the user's type of smile. If their t mouth is twisted or they can't really get the smile, that's one sign. You ask them to raise their arms. If there's weakness and they can't raise one of their arms, that's a sign. You ask them to say, what is it that's wrong with you? A simple sentence. If they can't repeat that simple sentence, don't let that patient go for three hours without medical attention. You've got a three hour span for stroke. You ought to call 911 and have that patient taken to the hospital. It's, it's tragedy to see a patient go to bed because I'll feel better in the morning and the next morning you've got extremities paralyzed. It's very useful information and the kind of information that can save lives. Mm -hmm. We're so grateful to have you Dr. Staggers. Thank, Thank you for all the work you've done in the community. We're now going to move to our yoga demonstration um, to pick up where we left off last month with Autumn Alvarez. Enjoy. Thank you sir. Put your hands on the floor by your knees push into the floor and lift your torso to an upright position. Let's come to a standing position. Put your block to the outside of your left foot. We'll come into a triangle position. Left foot forward and bring your right foot back. The block is now going to be to the outside of your front foot. Inhale the arms parallel to the legs. Look over your front fingers, and with straight legs, exhale the torso over the front leg and descend your hand to the block. Inhale, reach the top hand towards the ceiling and turn the chest, looking up at your fingers. Long, smooth inhalation as you reach down into the floor with your feet and you feel the fingers lengthening up towards the ceiling. Inhale and lift up to a standing position. Turn the left palm or the left uh, foot to neutral and walk your feet together. Let's switch sides, grab your blocks and put them on the other side of your sticky mat. Right foot to the inside of the block, left foot back. Inhale the arms up, lengthen your fingers, look over your right fingers and with a long legs, Lengthen over the front leg, bring your hand down to the block. Inhale, lengthen the left arm up towards the ceiling as you turn your chest and look up at your fingers longingly. And then inhale, pulling the feet into the floor. And on your next inhale, up towards a standing position 
and turn your feet to neutral. Walk your feet together, turn to face your right side, and then bend your knees down. Sit back onto your heels, and bring your hands back toward your feet. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that. We're now joined by another special guest, uh, our Alameda County Public Health Department Diabetes Program Director, Brenda Yamashita. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Diabetes. Now, that's a disease that has a lot of significance in the overall health of people in Alameda County and um, elsewhere in this country. What can you tell us about diabetes? What is it as a disease? Well, it's a combination of things, and there's actually several types of diabetes, but the main one that about 90% of the people have is called type 2 diabetes, which has to do with either a lack of insulin or an improper use of insulin. Sometimes you can have very high levels of insulin, but your body's not using it properly to assimilate the glucose that you have from food and things that you eat. Okay, so insulin is necessary to do what? to actually process glucose, to give you energy, to make your body function properly with the food that you eat. Okay, and insulin comes from the pancreas. Correct. And then it, it does, it helps the body process sugars in various forms. Right. And so type two diabetes is the, as you describe, the improper use of insulin or the lack of insulin. And um, what we want to do is turn to um, our man on the street, our man and woman on the street, and find Great. out how they view diabetes, what they know about diabetes. Good. It has something to do with your, with the distribution of, uh, of, uh, is it insulin? Low insulin. Glucose, high glucose, okay. too much. Not enough glucose in your system, which means that gets, um, sugar uh, low sugar or as a high sugar or? well the body is not producing enough insulin it's not balancing its sugar intake or utilizing it uh, properly and when you have that you have an imbalance of insulin in the blood versus sugar diabetes is a condition where the pancreas does not manufacture enough insulin to deal with the sugar that is in that you intake Well, some of the health risks of diabetes definitely is blindness, uh, eventually amputation. You lose one of your limbs. I know you can get like hands and toes and all of that cut off because I know some people that have lost, uh, have lost body parts. Organ deterioration, uh, lots of times vision impairment, amputation can be a uh, side of, you know, side effect of your circulation is impaired. Constant amputation of the ankle below the knee, the knee, the thigh, then death. I mean, I've seen it two or three occasions in the family. Well, there's one, death. Again, I hate to say it as it hurts you sexually. I get uh, numb and lazy. I don't feel, I am sleepy. I feel tired, but I cannot go sleep. I feel very uncomfortable. Diabetes worries me. Uh, my mother's diabetic. My sister's diabetic, my grandfather died from diabetes, so I know it's a serious disease. Uh, and it's something that I, I've started to really think about it a lot recently, uh, dieting, taking care of myself a little bit better because my sister got diabetes in her mid-30s. Oh, I'd say that probably is about two teaspoonfuls. I don't really know for sure, but I would say about two teaspoonfuls. Maybe five? Um, I'll put it like this, it's over 50. A lot. I think 27%. About 10. Wow, like 10? It's 10. Oh, 10. <laughs> 10 <laughs> teaspoonfuls. It's a good You're thing gonna... you don't drink it. Yeah, no, I only drink diet. <laughs> Welcome back. Boy, we've got some educated people in Alameda County who really know their diabetes. Now, um, Brenda, Diabetes can cause a lot of things, and we heard about some of those things, amputations, heart attacks, visual problems, kidney disease. Right. 
tell us in your experience um, the kinds of complications that you've seen and the things that we're trying to prevent here in Alameda County with our diabetes program. Well, absolutely, we see a lot of amputations. Um, it's the leading cause of blindness for people under the age of 45. And, um, we see a lot of heart disease, and as we were just talking about blood pressure and stroke, um, when you have diabetes, you're four times more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important that people get their diabetes under control because they don't have to have those complications if they control it. Wow, so that's an underlying risk factor for two of the five leading causes of death here in Alameda Absolutely. County and elsewhere. That's, that's impressive. And, and, and diabetes, from my understanding, is now seventh on the list of, of killers in Alameda County. So it independently is actually killing people in addition to its contribution to heart disease, stroke, um, and some other diseases. That's right. So the Alameda County Public Health Department has a diabetes uh, program. Yes. Tell us what the focus of the program is. Well, we have a couple of focuses. Um, one is we do case management where we actually go to someone's home and we work with them to make sure that they have all the things they need to control their diabetes. Um, the other is education, which is the most important. Um, we hear people constantly say, why didn't anyone ever tell me that when they've been living with diabetes for 10 years? So we actually hold classes mm -hmm. to help them better understand their disease because diabetes is what's called a self-managed disease. You're expected to know what to do for yourself. Mm -hmm. There's not maybe a specialist telling you what to do all the time or somebody watching you. You need to know because everything you do all day can impact your diabetes. Mm -hmm. So education is very high up there. And one of the ways that we find people really respond well to education is to work with peer educators, people who are living with diabetes or living with somebody who has diabetes. So we are starting a peer education program to actually train individuals to go out and help people with diabetes understand how to better control it. Because it will give us a broader reach into the community, we'll be able to get to more places, hopefully in additional languages and really start to get control of the diabetes and the complications that can happen within um, our county. So a lot of self-management, a lot of education, um, and what we're doing in the county then is trying to increase the level of awareness and the ability for people to manage their own diabetes. Right. That's great. Now, what parts of the county are you working in and how are you working, how are you enrolling people into these diabetes education classes? Well, people can be referred by their physician or they could call themselves. They can call 510-383-5185 to find out about when the next classes are and where they are. We are currently trying to go to all parts of the county, um, which is why we need the peer educators to help us get there. Um, there's a limited amount of staff and so the more people we have that are out there passing the word around, the better we'll get control of diabetes. And, the more places we'll be able to be. So um, we're just really, we're looking for people who are interested so they can call that same number if they're interested in becoming a peer educator. Repeat that number again. It's 510-383-5185. How many people in Alameda County do we think have diabetes? There's over 60,000 people with diabetes. Wow. Yeah, and about another 20 to 30 who are living with diabetes and don't know it because they haven't been diagnosed yet. There's not always a lot of signs and symptoms to let you know you have diabetes. So like the people that Dr. Staggers talked about with high blood pressure who are walking around and are unaware of it because of the silent disease that high blood pressure is, at least initially, diabetes can also be somewhat silent yes. in some people. Yes, yeah, and it's very important if you're 45 or older that you've been tested. And you probably have to ask your physician, have you tested me for diabetes? Um, it's a very simple blood test. Um, you go in the morning when you've been fasting and they take your blood and they're able to tell if you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, meaning you're heading towards diabetes, or you don't have it at all. And if you are, have a first degree relative, meaning your mother, father, sister, brother, who has diabetes, you should start to be tested by age 35. Okay. So if I'm one of those folks out there who maybe is in the 60,000 who has diabetes or in the 30,000 who has it but doesn't know it, what should I do? Should I go to my doctor and talk to them about how to best manage my diabetes? Is that what, what we're telling people? It's always good to speak to your physician. It's also good to talk to your pharmacist, especially since there's quite a few drugs that somebody who has diabetes takes. They're both very good people to consult with. But for education purposes, 
it's better to enroll in some type of a class where you can really have some time spent with you on how to eat, how to take your medication, how to exercise, all the things you need to know so you can avoid those complications. Ah, so we're back to exercise and diet. So those are important components Correct. of preventing and managing diabetes. Absolutely. And is the diabetes program focusing on that in the peer education classes? Yes, in fact, um, nutrition is such an important component for diabetes that we actually devote two full classes to that. And then we have another one that we devote to exercise and how to incorporate that into your life. And one of the things we do as part of education is to help a person set goals and to set reasonable goals. Not to say, okay, I'm gonna exercise and now I'm gonna go run a mile. When you've been sitting on a couch for a long time, you're not gonna run a mile right away. But you could get started walking and maybe you walk for 10 minutes and you slowly increase that. So we work on teaching them how to set goals and how to attain them. If I wanna do this, do I have to pay any money or how do I get involved in this class? How much time does it take and, and what's the commitment? There is no money involved. Um, we are doing the classes right now for free and it is seven classes, two hours each. So it's 14 hours worth of education and you do need to try and commit to that because you need to really hear everything because one class leads to the next and connects the information. So. Well, thank you so much, Brenda, for thank coming you for having and, me. and telling our Alameda County residents about how to get involved in these programs and about this important disease, diabetes. We've had the pleasure today about, to hear about two very important diseases that are also risk factors for other diseases that are the leading killers of Alameda County residents. We hope that through these kinds of shows you'll learn more about how to protect yourself against these diseases and that you'll take the initiative to go to your doctor to come to the Public Health Department to learn about ways in which you can either detect the disease in yourself or help manage the disease in your friend or loved one. Alameda County Public Health Department is dedicated to putting the public back in public health. We are your public health department. We strongly believe that we can only do public health well by engaging you. So thank you and stay tuned for the public's health in the months to come.